Uh, good afternoon, everyone in New York or wherever you are. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, my name is Matthew Higgs, uh, the director of White Columns, and it's a great pleasure to be hosting this evening's conversation between the artists David Muramoire and Jeanette Munt. And this evening's conversation is taking place on the occasion of David's solo exhibition, uh, which is currently on view at White Columns and will be on view through December 18. Uh, so if you haven't had a chance to see it yet, uh, there's plenty of time. Uh, we're here uh, as a kind of online virtual book launch for David's new book, uh, Rainbow Lilies and Gangrene Blues, uh, which has been published by Jeanette Munt's imprint, Das Munt, uh, this year. And it's the second uh, publication from Jeanette's uh, artist run publishing concern. And I won't say any more. I'm going to introduce Jeanette and David. They'll be in conversation. And David will read from the text. And you'll also see some images of spreads from the book. So, with no further ado, it's uh, my great pleasure to introduce Jeanette Munt and David Muramar. Awesome. Thank you so much, Matthew. Um, and thank you um, so much to Aaron and Brittany and Anne and everyone at White Columns. Um, so I'm going to start with a reading uh, from the book. The Badlands. Huge flashes of spider lightning surrounded my car. These spiders of electricity crashed down to the flatlands around me, making connections inside the earth. I left Cleveland in the morning, traveled through Chicago, and slept by the Mississippi River that night. The next day, I found myself in an enormous rainstorm in South Dakota with the wind pushing my car all over the highway. I rolled all of the windows down and turned the music off. This could be a vision moment, I thought to myself. With no cars in sight, I closed my eyes and let go of the steering wheel, waiting for a sign. The next thing I felt was a huge thud. My hands searching for the steering wheel and my feet stomping for the brake pedal. My car was spinning in circles and I felt like my head was in a washing machine. On a slow motion cycle, my brain slowly crashed into one wall of my skull and then the other back and forth. Two minutes later, the tornado had pulled out and the sky was still. When I opened my eyes and turned off the car, I swung open the door and barfed on the side of the road. Darkness hugged the landscape. Everything was in black and white except for my two headlights projecting vibrant colors onto the road ahead. I looked into the psychedelic streams and saw a naked man, or should I say a boy? He was in full color. In fact, he was changing colors. Every time I blinked, he became another hue of the spectrum, green to orange and purple. He looked like a newly born colt with fragile legs and an alien face. He was lying in the fetal position, a roadblock on the asphalt. He was hugging a stuffed animal toy. I exited the car and, rock, and walked right up to the creature. I called him Tony and he held a small gray pony. His red, wet eyes were fixed on mine. 
in that moment of suffering, a smoke signal rose above with the stream, a purple light exiting out of that stuffed pony's cage. This thick smoke poisoned Tony and me. Our insides turned mauve and became inflamed. His member began to grow, pointing to the Northern Lights. And in that light, I could see them, the wicked warlocks of the West. At first, it was my father's face of shame, transforming into my grandfather's, eventually cycling through all of the boys that bullied me brutally in school. I could hear my dead uncle's voice, I'll kill you if you ever become one of those faggots. They all carried a look of shame. Tony could feel the pain it produced inside of me and began swinging at this shape-shifting warlock projection. His stuffed animal pony made its way into the mix and with it, the stuffing of the toy began to fly batting of intestines, lungs, heart, brain, and blood flying everywhere. He was letting me know how he felt and trying to be courageous, but he had no control over his own rage. He wanted very much to protect me, but he was creating a larger problem. After he gutted the carcass clean, he climbed inside. This was Tony Pony, and oh, how I rode him. He was a stubborn pony, bucking as he fucked me hard, tucking my head into his fur, my body covered in blood. The pony soul entered the equation and it was a threesome of sorts, a trinity of animal, boy, and me. As his member throbbed inside of my skeleton, all I could think about was his body bobbing in a river. Clean us of this blood and this spiritual love, I screamed to the sky. The pony owned my own shame, and I knew he would soon try to own me. He was an idiot and I had lusts for him. After our Ponyland ritual, we journeyed further west into the Badlands. Beautiful, dead, rocky earth. We walked over the rough terrain and I could see the city of Emerald in the distance. I thought about jumping from the rocks an escape from this male animal presence. But after navigating the landscape for a while, we found ourselves in the Black Hills. The smell of this dark pine forest instantly cleansed my nostrils. I saw my first buffalo in those woods. It seemed as though all the buffalo had been hiding from me but not after Tony entered into me. He had a way with animals. As we got deeper into the Black Hills, his animal magnetism increased. Animals were ripping out of the woods on either side of the car. Oh, lions, tigers and bears, oh my, I screamed. His eyes were turning a lighter shade of blue. Like ice, they glowed. I wondered if it was a real love taking over Tony's heart or a poison. All of the fields of poppies he consumed were changing him. I did not like the man he was becoming. As we wrapped around the next curve, I saw the red shadow of reason, the buffalo wizard. He was an enormous, he was enormous and sending me telepathic messages about Tony. From behind a curtain, he told me how to take care of this Tony the Pony boy. 
So that is just what I did. I drove this pony named Tony right to the river. Out of the trunk, I got my cuffs, whip, ropes, and ruby slippers. One end of the rope I tied to Tony's hooves, and the other end I tied to a rock the size of my head. Crack went my whip as I led him into the river. Walk that plank, boy, I screamed. Tony obeyed my commands, and when the currents ripped him under, my eyes filled with tears. I stared at his body bobbing downstream as I clicked my heels together. A loud scream came from my mouth, and with it, a puff of purple smoke was released. There is no place like home. There was no going back. I could not turn around. I was on a journey to find my new home. Thank you, David. That was fantastic. Thanks. That's great. <laughs> it's a fantastic, it's such a good chapter with so much to talk about. Um, there's so much in that, but um, I want to start kind of generally, start generally with uh, sort of a bigger picture um, about the book and writing and then sort of move into the specifics of the book and pull out and go to the exhibition and then returns just to give a general idea of, of where I'm thinking of going. So um, to start, uh, I want to talk about the writing of the book as a whole. How did you start writing? How did you proceed? When did it happen? Just a general picture. Okay, yeah. So <clears throat> 10 years ago this year, my mom passed away. And I think immediately after she passed away, um, I kind of had this idea in my head that I wanted to write down the story of her life. and. Um, I mean, grief has such like a weird way of kind of like working in these waves. And so I think I started writing some stuff down and then I was like, I should take a class. And then I never did. And then um, maybe three years ago, I saw a flyer for a class at Gotham here in New York City. And they used to have like little, I remember it was like a little magazine actually, like, and it had all the classes listed in it. And I was like, you know what, I'm gonna take a class to learn how to write. Or I mean like get better at writing or something, like make sense of write, writing. And so I took a class there in person uh, which was very cool. It was super cool to like be around other writers because I mean, I went to school for art, um, specifically painting. And so writers are like, it's like a whole different way of thinking. There's like, it was really cool to kind of like be in this class and present work that I had worked on and like get reaction. And then I started taking classes with, um, Arielle Gore, uh, who is amazing, and she has online classes. Uh, and so I started taking them online. Um, and it was kind of, um, it, yeah, just taking all these classes, figuring out how to write again. And um, it started to, you know, the, you would get assignments. And so I started like building up these stories and then thinking back about uh, 10 years ago when my mom died and those stories that I had been writing then and like, how could I make sense of all this writing together? Um, 
And oh. so the, yeah, so really just like piecing it together and like listening to other writers and how they like structure books. Like, how do you make all these stories become like, are they short stories or are they like one narrative or is it like a diary or, you know, so like making those decisions um, kind of came out of talking to these real authors. <laughs> you are a real author as it turns out. <laughs> Yeah, the decision making process seems the the that's I guess what I was getting at. Like, how did you end up making those decisions? So it was exposure to other writers. You know, you mentioned that I kind of want to ask. So you went to school for painting. Were you writing on the? You know, you have a multifaceted practice that includes performance, painting, um, music filmmaking so were you when you were at school or even before that were you writing at the same time as painting just to as a side practice you know I know that you took classes later but was this happening simultaneously um the songwriting started when I was in school and so and I was kind of thinking about that as like poetry like it seemed for me like poetry and songwriting are very like similar. And I think that's why I was able to kind of use lyrics as poems in the book, because they kind of, um, again, like I had never studied poetry or songwriting, but they like seemed, the structure of them seemed really similar to me and like the rhythm and stuff. Um, but then also writing my thesis, I studied with Tommy Lanigan Schmidt, he was my thesis advisor and um, he's amazing. I mean, he's amazing. I mean, he was at Stonewall. I mean, he's like amazing, amazing human being. And he, he, he really encouraged the writing of my thesis to be very like abstract and like pieced together. And so some of the writing actually did, I did pull from that early writing. Um, cause at that same time is kind of when I was, um, kind of right before I got sober too, I guess the first time. So that was kind of happening, happening simultaneously, I guess, okay. in that writing. Okay. And so the writing of the book was kind of a way, uh, was it a way of processing your, your mother's death? Was it sort of a cathartic experience? Yeah. I think at first it was like, it, it, at first, at first after she died, I really wanted to like write down the things I remembered about her life so I wouldn't really forget. And then as like years kind of went on, I like there, it was gone. Like some of those memories were kind of gone or like had shifted in my brain what they had, you know, what she had told me or what I remember. Uh, and then there was no one to really ask, or at least I couldn't ask her things. Yeah. You know what I mean? She was very like kind of secretive person too. Like even talking to my, her sisters now, they don't know a lot of things, you know I mean? She kept a lot of like uh, uh, secrets. So then as I'm writing and like started, you know, fictionalizing a lot of this stuff, cause a lot of it is fiction, you know, it's not real. Like there's a lot of not realness to it. Um, the, uh, then my star story started to weave into it. And it felt like I could tell my story and her story like parallel that would like, that made sense, you know? Um, but a lot of her story, like the fictionalized parts of it are kind of like pieces of me too, which I think, you know. Yeah, okay. So there's a lot there. Then there's pieces that I wanna talk about, but I'm gonna sort of pull sort of Pull them apart a little bit. So one of the, the big things in the book 
is this malleability of memory. Like you're saying, there's so much fiction, you weave this fiction in to kind of fill in the gaps and kind of imagine like the stories that of your, like you have some concrete mother stories, life stories, and then where there are gaps, you fill them in with this, like you were saying, you know, your life and your imagination of what, you know, your ideas of what she had experienced, what maybe what you wanted her to experience these sort of, uh, imagined life for her and you weave it in with yours and so you go back and forth between what is sort of what seems for the reader to be accessible memories and then this sort of more this fantasy this cerebral this otherworldliness and it's accompanied by you know these images and the lyrics and the poetry and so you have this really uh, amazing sort of physical understanding of how memory works because of course we know that, like there's some language there's some images and they get messed up and they get mixed up and they they you shape them as you age is like what you were just saying and so this is such a big part of the book and it's as the reader you really experience this kind of construction and malleability of memory and maybe can you just speak to how you know how you decided which images to include and which poems to include when in the book as you were writing. Yeah, the, the, a lot of the image, there were a lot more images that I was gonna include actually originally, and I kind of edited them, edited them down. Um, but I think a lot of the writing was kind of informed by images too. Um, because the images came first and then the writing came second for, for, for most of it. So um, in some, looking back at some of those images, which were like on real film, like that I had like scan, like scanned photos, it, it brought back memories of like certain time periods. Like, okay, in 2015, I made this painting and like, I remember why I made this painting and it kind of connects to this like event in my life or something like that. Um, but uh, so definitely the images came first and then the writing kind of came second. And um, for instance, that reading that I just did, the image that kind of comes after that is an image that's in my studio and there happens to be an image of uh, Judy Garland's face in one of the paintings, which, you know, directly relates to like Wizard of Oz. I mean, this imagery is like very obviously like in that reading. And um, so that kind of triggered that, um, that, you know, being placed there. Um, and it was also really important for me when I started reaching out to publishers that, um, that uh, the images be included, you know? Cause that's like a huge thing that like when you have a book published, like they don't always want the images or they want them all in black and white because it costs, the costs get too high. And so that why, yeah. So that was important to include those. And it also made it really great working with you and not having them edited out, you know? <laughs> um, and then later on working with Karen, who, uh, Rassaby, who had designed the book and some of the decisions that she was making, like for instance, all the images in the book that are in like candid shots in the studio are in black and white. And so that was like an interesting choice that she kind of brought to it um yeah and then the lyrics as well the songs also hold like certain spaces like of like certain memory and um so they kind of were placed very like specifically to that yeah they they are very effective at the, you read the story and then you have this uh, lyric that gives you a sort of a new depth to the story and it comes with uh, an image that also allows you to kind of 
create a much a much more uh, concrete uh, you know experience of what you're reading. You know, it's really effective. And you know, it happens in the paintings uh, that you have in the exhibition as well. When you have, you know, there, there's a lot of layering that happens in your work, um, and the the paintings have this as well. When you have the printed image, and then you have a painted image, and then you have a painted word, and so you have this, uh, you know really multifaceted experience in your work. And, um, you know, I, I've been to some of your performances and they operate in a similar way where there's, there's video and there's music and there's you and there's Enid Ellen and there's many different layers. So can you talk a little bit maybe about um, if these layers, like how you experience this Work, when you're working, does one come and then the other? Do they come at the same time? How do they, how do you, how do, what's the process working this way? Yeah. Um, well, I guess the first, I was really into theater as a kid. Like theater was a big thing and making art was a big thing. But I think theater kind of got pushed out of me because of like, you know, some a bullying. Bullying pushed theater out of me. So I kind of felt like, I mean, when I look back at it and then I kind of um, retreated to the studio and it was like a safe space to like make things and not have, be like on performing or like not to be on, um, on stage with, with things. Um, and so, uh, then, uh, so when I moved to New York and I started painting in a studio here, I remember like dressing up and like putting on heels and stuff while I was painting. Cause I, th I felt like it kind of like gave me like a certain, like, especially heels, they give you like a certain like position that your body's in. Yes. And I felt like it kind of like helped me react to, to like to the paint. It like pushed something like very like kind of physically. And um, so in a certain way that kind of like that performance of doing that was like happening alone. You know what I mean? Even like how it's referenced in um, the article about my mom wearing her clothing and how it, a lot of it started like when I would be in her closet and putting on her clothing. Um, and so those like private kind of like performances. Um, but I think that like a lot of the, I mean, just to kind of like reflect back on that, like about the grief too, it feels like there's something about like bringing the fantasy into grieving that like the healing process, it like, it helps. Like, I would say that my relationship with my mother is so much better now uh, because I can, like, make up a story about how it's, like, it's healed, you know what I mean? And um, so that's, I think, what the, um, the character of Enid Allen, too, kind of brings that to it. Like, when I try to use it as a voice um to kind of like fill in the blanks of her story or to think of it as like mother nature these kind of like it's not like me you know what I mean like I like I, those are like huge shoes to fill but it's like it's kind of like a process of kind of working through that yeah yeah yeah, there's a lot there. This is one of the images from the book in black and white. And uh, you can see the Judy Garland image there yeah. that, you know, it features that the inspiration features in the in the chapter that you read. Um, yeah, so this is Karen, the designer's decision to keep these in black and white, which is, is you know, it's a was very smart and makes a lot of sense. And you really re look, reading the book, you have this separate experience with the black and white images versus the color ones. So, 
That's what you were speaking of. The there's so much in what you just said with the heels, painting in the heels, the performance of painting in the studio alone for yourself, the healing through making up the stories. I mean, it's so, all of this is amazing and has so much to do with the book and is uh, it's exciting. I'm, there's many places to go in. I wanna pull, <laughs> I wanna go into some of the themes because you just mentioned in that talk, you just in, in that segment, you just mentioned a whole bunch of themes that really carry throughout the book. A major one is mother nature. There is, um, you know, there's a lot of spirituality that goes through the book, through your painting, in, in the performances, in the films, you know, and you were, I know, you know, you were brought up Catholic. You, there was a time that you uh, were practicing, even as a young person, uh, Christian science, you were exposed to this and you followed this path. And then, you know, but there is a steady, consistent uh, in interaction and sort of devotion to mother nature. And the painting behind me is a landscape and it features, mother nature features prominently in your life, in your healing, in your development, in the construction of who you are and your work. So can you speak a little bit about, about your relationship to nature? Yeah. Um, well, I think I was telling you this the other day about like how, like early memory, I mean, I grew up in a very rural part of Ohio where it was very wooded. I mean, you couldn't see your neighbor's house because there were woods all around and people liked it that way. You know what I mean? Like you don't, you don't pay attention to your neighbor. You don't tell your neighbor what to do, that kind of stuff. And um, so with the situation with my mother being such a, having the disease of alcoholism, I found myself retreating to the woods quite a bit, like to hide in the woods. But I also was kind of one of these kids that, um, I didn't really enjoy watch. I mean, I enjoy watching TV now, but when I was a kid, I really didn't like it so much. Like I have friends that were like brainwashed, like the hypnotized by the television. And um, I wasn't really one of those kids. I kind of wanted to be outside more. And so a lot of times I would just find myself outside. I mean, if my parents would just be like, go play outside. We were very trusted. I, I, don't, I can't even think about this now, like as being a young person, like just being thrown out in the woods, just, you know, go do your thing out there. And a lot of like secretive kind of stuff happened out in the woods. I would say I like discovered a lot of stuff. Like I discovered how to smoke cigarettes out in the woods and like how to smoke weed out in the woods and like drinking out in the woods, you know what I mean? And um, sexual experimentation out in the woods with like your friends when you're a kid. Um, there, it, the woods really became like a sacred safe space. And, um, and it also played into like fantasy for me. I mean, I was very much into like, you know, pioneers, you know, being on, you know, Oregon Trail, whatever. Um, and so, it was really kind of like a refuge uh, out in the woods. And um, I think too, that a lot of like the religious stuff, I, there was always like a, a connection to something like bigger. I think as like a queer person, I kind of like made it the way I wanted it so that I could survive in these spaces. Like I was like, okay, like, I, you know, um, would just using the religions in ways that could like benefit my survival, you know? Um, and I mean, I think about like the way that I talk about Mary Baker Eddy, who is like one of the founders of, um, Christian scientist, she was the founder of Christian scientist. She fell on ice, she broke her hip and she was given the teachings of Christian science. She transcribed them while she was bedridden. You know what I mean? This stuff is like, it's just, it's so much of what America is. You know what I mean? It's like, think about Mormonism. I think about the stories of how that stuff formed and like why 
um, why a lot of Europeans came over to America, a lot of it was for religious, you know, reasons because, you know, they were being persecuted or whatever. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes. So, yeah, that, um, I mean, that's another big part of your work uh, is this is this sort of dive into what is America and what is American because, you know, there's there's many stories that, that it, throughout the book, there is this thread of you um, figuring out where you are in America. You're in the mid, well, you grew up in the Midwest, your mother's in the Midwest, your mother feels the pull to the West, you feel the pull to the West, you move throughout the country and there's, you know, you are very aware with being gay that you're an outsider. And so there is this trying to figure out what it means to be the outsider in America. And this is throughout the book, but it also is in the paintings, in the exhibition, you have the eagle, you know, you have these icons of American that you not, you, you pull apart. You don't, you you don't treat with you don't glorify but you sort of pull apart and investigate you know and this ties in uh you know we were talking the other day about how this sort of curiosity about what it means to be american ties in with your uh sort of love of nature and especially through um like the national parks and you said this thing when we were talking where you felt like you could, you know, when you, cause you go to national parks still and you write about how you would go to, you know, you spent a lot of time working in them when you were young, trying to find yourself. And you write about that in the book. And you, you, you said the other day when we were talking that it was a way to, to like explore America without the weight of being judged. So can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. Yeah, for sure, because definitely, which is like a major theme, part of this book is me going to Yellowstone National Park and getting that position there to work, um, which kind of just happened by chance. You know, I was like, okay, I'm gonna do this. And I, they were the first one that responded and I went. And that was really a time when I like left all the voices that were in Ohio and I could kind of just be with my own self. And that's really when I came out of the closet. Like it was like, this is the time. So I think maybe that has made national parks really important for me, but also being like a, um, and I still use it now. It's kind of like my, it is my religion now. It's like, I can go, these are like my meccas. Like I go to, you know, the Redwood National Park and see those trees and it's like, it blows my mind, you know? And there's so many of them in the United States. And especially, I guess, being in a, in a, um, in a white, cis, like a white cisgendered body, I can navigate through America in this way and go to these parks. And it's like, and I'm kind of left alone, um, which is like, it is a privilege. I mean, that's like a huge privilege to be able to, to do that. Um, but to go into some of these states that I would never go to, you know, I would never go to Wyoming. Um, but because I ended up at Yellowstone, it's like Wyoming is like one of my favorite states. You know what I mean? It's like such a beautiful state. Um, but there's a lot of like, you know, I mean, I think about Matthew Shepard, who is also somebody that's, you know, comes up in the book who, you know, was killed in Wyoming. I think about how conservative Wyoming is. Um, and uh, so, but the national parks are a way to kind of like get into those conservative parts of America and, um, and it, like connect to like what I think America, like 
what this land is like really about is the nature. Um, so that's, yeah, I think that is, and there's so many of them, you know what I mean? It, it's just, it's yeah. amazing. And it's the one thing, it's like the government protected these pieces of land and they can't take it back. You know what I mean? There's, there's parts of land that it, are protected in this country that like they can take it back, you know? But the national parks are like, they're really protected. So like, they're not gonna go in there and drill, which is like amazing that that, you know, exists, yeah. so. <laughs> <laughs> so can you talk a little bit about how you, what, like when you're, when you paint um, the, you know, the, the book is very personal, personal and it really is is you know pulling out in in language you know in text like what you your experiences with America and America being American and nature and such and then when the images like when the paintings in your in the exhibition like of the flag of the eagle etc you know can you kind of speak to how the the what these two different forms of expression kind of accomplished for you, just sticking, I guess, to one theme. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. Yeah, because the images, the paintings that are in the exhibition at the gallery um, came after the writing. Uh, so a lot of the themes that I was kind of working with in the book and writing about and the things that were going on in the world, I mean, because the I kind of started these at the beginning, maybe like eighteen months ago, the beginning of COVID. Kind of, I was in um, I was in Europe, and I had to fly back when they like locked everything down, and um, so these these paintings kind of that's when it started, um, and so painting during a pandemic and thinking about the history of um, pandemics, I was thinking about like AIDS in this country a lot and like how that affected uh, queer people, queer artists. Um, and I think a lot of those influences show up in the paintings too, these uh, different, um, queer artists that are kind of like referenced. Um, and everything that was going on, it was just, and still going on, it's just, it was kind of like a moment to kind of like reflect on what it even means to like be in this country. Um, I guess in that moment, um, and so a lot of the paintings kind of came directly out of what was kind of like what I was experiencing. Yeah. Yeah, that, I mean, yeah, that, uh, so that makes me, so that has me a little curious because the book, you know, the writing is, is so, so open. It is so sort of fearless and sort of shameless when you're dealing with things that, you know, um, Catholicism or polite society, et cetera, sort of has us understanding as shameful. And you so sort of, I mean, generously put forth into the world the really your interior, your experience, everything without fear, without bound, you know, you talk about, when I was reading, I was thinking about these places that writers go, like in uh, Jean Genet's Our Lady of the Flowers, or we, you know, you and I talked about it, Chantal Ackerman's uh, My Mother, My Mother Laughs, and, uh, and there are just these places that are so intimate, 
and so per deeply, deeply personal and perhaps a little, you know, what we understand as shameful, like, you know, masturbatory fantasies while you're sitting in prison or, you know, the, the real experience of your mother's health deteriorating. And you put this all forward in this book, you know, and, and it, you know, you were writing it over 10 years and then there is these paintings that are in the exhibition are, are similarly so very personal. Um, I kind of, what you were just saying about the experience of, of the pandemic and being, you know, the, the isolation of that and sort of wondering why you're in this country and everything, like, is there a parallel between maybe the, whatever the experience was of, of writing in such an open and honest, fearless manner and the the experience of painting during the pandemic are there are there some are there parallels there that you can kind of speak about does that make sense yeah totally totally i mean i feel like it really kind of like i mean looking at the the painting that's behind you right now yeah it i mean to just like sit and like look at what's outside the window like sit and look at trees or something um we were I was like we were kind of forced to do that like you were just kind of forced to like sit there and um and be with certain people and um and so I think the painting kind of at first I was kind of painting the plants that were in my house because uh, I was like, well, I'll just like paint what's around me, like paint these plants. And, um, and I had, none of the paintings are stretched. So I was just laying it out on the floor and painting the plants in, the, in my house. And um, so I think like a lot of it was originally, it, it was that like, how do I like, how do I get back to paint? And like, thinking about like what it originally kind of like was, it was an illustrator of like what was going on or even the Catholic church, like using it to tell these stories, you know what I mean? So I was like, I'm just going to do that. I'm going to like sit and look. And, and then, and then some of those stories did start to, to come through. Some of the paintings aren't like, you know, traditional like landscapes or there's other things that pop in there. There's one that has like these, um, uh, st starts to have these red pills in it because you know it's thinking about my dad and um and social media and and things like that so that stuff's just started to like feed into it you know but just having that time to kind of like force time to like stop and uh yeah it did something yeah yeah yeah, it opened opened some doors, maybe. Yeah, totally, totally. Yeah, um, that's great. Yeah, it um, it really, the book is is really incredible and and generous and, you know, the chapter that you read is so amazing. It it you know it pulls in all of these. I mean, all of these themes that we obviously don't get to talk about because of time, but like just the experience of how you played with pop culture in that, in, in that uh, chapter, you know, running the Wizard of Oz through it so well, and it becomes almost a character. And like throughout the book, you have these, like you were speaking to earlier that, you know, these pop culture, the some fantasies, these, you know, parallel your life and allow you to kind of process what's happening and sort of protect you from these, the exterior elements that you were experienced because you were gay, because you were an outsider, because your mother was an alcoholic, all of these things. And it's, it's just such a generous, really amazing uh, piece of writing. And it's completely inspirational. And I, I just felt like it's really you pulling, you know, yourself into the world. And, the, you know, when you read it alongside the paintings and you've seen your performances and every, it's just really, really rich. And I love it so much. And I know that there was one more chapter that you wanted to read before Matthew jumps back in. So maybe 
this has to do with like the, this is the uh, end of the book, right? So if you want to go ahead and, so yeah. do you want to maybe go full screen? Sure. I don't know if someone can do that, but that would no, be great. Am I not? Oh, wait, I'm on, oh. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Enid Ellen. Late one evening in my house by the ocean, the wind began to blow the birch tree branches against the windows. It was so loud that I could not fall asleep. I knew something was going on. I decided to listen to her call. I had to be the adult. Moving around upstairs, she was communicating to me again. Usually she would just pass out in her bed, but these nights of mania would come every once in a while. I would have to stay awake and alert, trying to lure her back just to get her out of my head. Suddenly, I saw her run down the stairs, quick like a little bird. No fear, only emotions driven with the speed of a lioness. I walked across the old wooden floors. They made musical sounds as my feet floated on their grains. I looked out the sliding glass door, the light in the garage was on. Would she drive away? I was nervous, so I decided to investigate. Out the back door I went, my robe of white silk fluttered in the ocean breeze like her favorite meringue. Tears flooded my eyes from the salt in the air. My feet hit the concrete of the garage and I looked up. The cold sand made my body shiver as I clenched my chest with my hands. There was my mother standing in the garage completely naked. She was looking for something among my father's tools. I knew she was looking for a bottle holding a message of love. Straight ahead, an orange neon light glowed. Near the water lay a beached whale. The glow was coming from inside the carcass. I put my hands on the skin of the whale and it split open with a giant explosion. Intestines and organs slid out of the shell. Deep inside the nucleus of the creature lay my mother's bloated body. She had been dead for years now, but she looked beautifully preserved. Although I knew what she was in search of, I still asked her what she was doing. She insisted that she was missing my father, waiting for him to come back, her hair frazzled up in a scrunchie. The whale carcass had a stench like no other and my mother's body looked like a baby cradled inside. Latex skin covering my skin, climbing into her shape and form. I would pretend to be the voice of my mother. Mother nature, queen mother, the exhaustion overwhelmed me and I fell into a deep sleep that night. The tide rode me in and out, in and out. When I awoke, a circle of seagulls flew above my head. One swooped down, landed on my forehead, took a shit and baptized me. She gave me my name, Enid Ellen. In and out. You need me, little furry deer. Connecting moles, little voids, holes, messages, trails, tears. 
I can talk to the animals. I can talk to the animals. The waves will wash me in and out. The waves will wash me in and out, in and out, in and out, in and out. Enid Ellen. Okay, I don't seem to be there. I don't know if I'm there. Oh, I just don't see it on my screen. Um, David, Jeanette, can you both hear me? Yes. yes. Uh, thanks so much. That was amazing. Uh, so much to think about. And certainly I'll look at all the paintings again in a completely different light. Uh, just like to thank everybody for joining us. Uh, this conversation will be archived and available at whitecoms.org. Uh, and the book uh, is available to purchase from White Calms, And I assume where all good books are sold. Uh, so thanks again, Jeanette. Thanks again, David. Uh, we really appreciate it. And I hope everybody enjoys their evening. Goodbye. <laughs>